So today, uh, Patty and uh, Yvonne are with us to talk about implementing therapy services at a systems level. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to start sharing yours and um, help us all to grow together. Sorry about that. I lost my toolbar for somehow. So good morning, Patty and I are really excited to um, be here and to be able to talk about this. Um, we've been having a lot of discussions about working at a population or systems level. Um, what does that look like in the schools? How do we do that? How do you um, layer in our professional reasoning um, at a systems level? And so, um, but we see a lot of potential with it as well. So a lot of this is sharing some of our initial thoughts and um, thinking through um, what we really can do to be more effective and efficient with the time and the resources we have to meet the needs, um, really the ever-changing and increasingly complex needs of the students that we serve. So we really invite this to be a conversation more than us just talking at you the whole time and um, so if you have questions, feel free to put that in the chat or um, let us know some of your thoughts as, as we go through this as well. Okay. So um, just really briefly, learning objectives are here, um, but we'll really look at populations and systems and then how we might be able to um, work at a populations or systems um, um, level within the schools. So we are recognizing that we're working in more complex um, systems contexts, starting with healthcare. There's changes in our demographics, in access, in complexity, um, reimbursements becoming challenging. There's a lot of um, discussion about what people's roles are, uh, what's your distinct value. And we're seeing the same thing is starting to happen in educate. Well, not starting, but we're seeing the same thing is happening in increasingly in education as well. That um, our systems are um, equally as complex and maybe even more complex. Um, we're trying to to manage both legislative and educational mandates. There's changes in demographics and access. Um, there's increasing complexity. Um, to the, some of the services that we're having to provide. We're seeing that the, um, there's a whole, there's changes in some of our roles, um, in some ways expanding. Um, sometimes I try and avoid the word expanding because people think, oh, there's, you're just getting into my territory. But really what it is, is that as things change in our society, our roles as part of educators, as part of working in the system changes as well, right? We're not, we're not expanding into technology or expanding into using AI. AI has now become part of increasingly our, our system. And so we need to learn how to utilize some of those types of um, changes and how to address some of those changes with the students that we're working with. Um, we're seeing a lot more school-wide initiatives and how do we fit within that as related service personnel and really thinking through um, what decision-making looks like. And often we're seeing less of being able to make decisions in individual silos and needing to work with um, um, more consensus types of um, approaches. So um, we have to address these educational priorities that we're seeing emerge. And some of the um, priorities that we're seeing within ed reform is um, that children with disabilities are needing to be educated in the neighborhood schools in regular classrooms, and that it's teams of professionals that are working together to um, meet the needs of these students. 
We're also seeing that um, progress needs to be monitored, often collaboratively. We need to know that we're reaching our outcomes and that educational achievement, and including high graduation or employment rates, all of that needs to be addressed for individuals with disabilities. So with some of these educational form priorities, what should our services look like? What should be some of the things that we need to do to provide um, the best services? And one of those is making sure that we're addressing natural and least restrictive environments as much as possible. So we need we know from research that meaningful participation occurs in natural environments. We know that both of, that all of our professions as related service providers, but specifically OTPT, are committed to participation. And we know from motor learning theory and some of that other research that um, working in um, within naturally occurring routines, actually practicing the task in the ways where they'll actually have to do the task leads to better outcomes. We also know that we have um, professional guidance that informs our services through IDEA and through our standards of practice, all of which talk about naturally occurring routines, natural environments, in, um, increasing participation for students with disabilities. We also know that this support of inclusion and participation um, means that we need to look at how to help students engage in tasks in natural contexts, because we know that that leads to that improved performance and participation. We also know that um, meaningful engagement is both a means and an end to therapy. So we use meaningful engagement to help learn other tasks, but we also use it because we want them to become more proficient at a specific task. And so within that, what we're seeing in the literature is more discussion around collaborative goal setting, collaborative instruction, um, services such as coaching, um, thinking about more um, feedback, thinking about um, how to better improve functional mobility and self-care performance and participation through the types of feedback that we're giving. So all of these types of um, um, discussions are happening within our literature, even some discussions around how some of our services are provided. Would it be better to have intense services for a short period of time and then no services to, to practice those skills? And so all of that leads to this discussion of what does how what does this best look like? What can what can we do? Um, we know that when you start talking about participation, um, that we're um, needing to look at the environment, we're needing to look at the practitioners, and we're needing to look at the interventions that we're providing. So we're hearing more discussions around things like um, strength-based. We, um, we're hearing discussions around person-centered. We're not just looking at impairments or what the um, child or student can't do right now, but what do they need to be able to do in the future and how are we gonna be preparing them for that? Um, <clears throat> we're looking at things like, are we trained in really understanding as practitioners, cultural understanding and being able to respond to the diverse needs of the populations we're serving now? Um, how do we um, stress engagement over normalcy? Um, how do we address things like you maybe are hearing words like ableism? I have a hard time saying that word sometimes. Um, but what are what are we doing that really supports, and what are we learning so that we can best support those that we're serving? And thinking about the environments that we're working in, are we really supporting participation for everybody? Are we really looking at accessibility? for all so that everyone is able to participate. Patty, did you want to add anything about some of this? No, I think you, you've, you've captured um, the bulk of it. I think, you know, just as you said, the, the key here is, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, is how do we integrate all of this? That this yeah. all sort of simultaneous. So, um, so yeah, the point being, there's, there's a lot of balls in the air, um, a lot of components that we're thinking about. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I've been working now for, dare I say this, more than um, 30 years in the schools, and I think it's become increasingly complex. And so sometimes 
our um, tendency as humans is then to turtle and go to what's most familiar, which is then I'm going to pull back and do what I feel safe and, and is familiar to do. And I think part of the discussion and part of um, what Patty and I've been looking a lot at is how do we not do that so that we can provide the best services for those that um, we're serving. So how do we implement these um, inclusive, contextual, and collaborative um, services? Um, so one of the discussions that we're really having is we may need to look beyond the traditional individual and group interventions that we've done and think about population and system-based interventions. And we know that there's a lot of logistical, um, we could do a whole presentation just around a lot of the logistical side of this, right? Well, how would you write that on an IEP? And how would people count for what I'm doing? And all, all of those kinds of things. And um, <clears throat> Today, we just want to introduce the idea and get you thinking about it and the more of a big picture. We recognize that to continue this conversation and to continue to move into this, we'll have to have some of the logistical conversations as well. And we have some thoughts about that. So maybe during the Q&A time at the end, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about it. But first, we want to get people thinking about how do we even start thinking about this and how do we even start um, moving in that um, in this direction. So what is a system? Um, we know that that is kind of an organized collection of all the parts. Um, and they're all working together to um, accomplish a specific goal. And so when we start looking in our literature about populations and systems, um, often you can think about populations being um, <clears throat> Maybe your school district or a um, um, a classroom where the system might be more, I'm sorry, a school or a classroom where the system might be the um, school district. But at times the school might be the system. And so the, so recognizing that um, when we have these this conversation that we're really looking at uh, whatever is the group that's kind of making that those decisions and having to integrate multiple sources of information and thinking about kind of interrelationships among all the different decisions that are being um, made, the drivers, the um, what are some of the influences and so forth. So um, what, what sort of brought us to this whole conversation is Yvonne and I have been doing a lot of thinking and working with colleagues around the idea of populations and systems-based services. And, and we know that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of language, there's a lot of push out there um, to, to provide population and systems level services. And we can find those things in things like our professional standards, um, and I know for both OTs and PTs, there's very explicit statements about, about ensuring that we are providing services at the population level to, uh, to the clients that we serve. It's written into our code of ethics. We know that it's there um, in terms of some of the, um, the conversations and comments in IDEA about inclusion and least restrictive environment. And it's been a central part of education reform, particularly around ESSA. But what's been really interesting to us is that though we have these sort of um, statements in the literature and in our regulatory guidance that says, go out and provide population and systems-based services, we don't have a lot of tools yet available to us about how we actually go about and do that, um, particularly as it relates to our clinical reasoning. So, um, so what we've begun to kind of put together is ways that we can use some of our ecological um, theoretical approaches to help us think through what are the challenges and possibilities with regard to uh, understanding the hows. So, um, Yvonne, if you kind of click through the next few slides kind of quickly, um, you'll see that um, essentially what we bring to the conversation are, are, are essentially, you know, parallel professional reasoning structures, right? We know very well how we 
um, how we think about students, design instruction and intervention to promote student learning. We have a lot of very explicit professional reasoning structures that we know well around how to work with teachers, how to build teacher capacity, and how to ensure that they carry over. And many of us are even um, doing some school level, some district level um, uh, programmatic support around looking at school processes, maybe looking at school programs, finding ways to implement them in a more kind of systems level approach to build efficiency. But what becomes really challenging, if you can go forward, is integrating all of those together. So we know in systems thinking, as Yvonne talked about, that we have all of these inputs that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and those inputs, whether they be teachers, admin, students, parents, school board, um, the complexity around those inputs has increased quite significantly. And, and, and like Yvonne, I mean, I can certainly reflect as well um, uh, over the time, the 30 plus years that I've been in school practice, that, um, that, that these inputs look nothing like they used to look like. But we know that they're really important and that we need to be kind of integrating our thinking around these inputs to really change um, and, and, and develop methods that can produce the kinds of results that we want to see. And those outputs, those outcomes that we can be thinking about, look across all of the, the um, outcomes and expectations that are on our shoulders at any given time, whether they be student learning, working with teachers to build their capacity and improve their efficiency, um, supporting our school div divisions outcomes. You know, are we are we promoting and and supporting their ability to do the work that they need to do given the resources that they have, and then our own recognition and really thinking about, um, you know, are we you know are we demonstrating our value in the context of those contexts? So um, and so we know that in order to be effective. In, um, in achieving a systems level approach, we need to be um, placing ourselves in a, in a context where we're, we're receiving constant feedback um, from, uh, from all of the inputs, from the methods that we put in place and from the outcomes that we are generating. So as Yvonne talked about, we need to be in a space where we can um, ensure that we can capture and, uh, and observe and, and take time for reflection on what all of these, these factors are at, and when they're at play. So, um, so again, we, we know that there are challenges to systems thinking that really do have a role in our day-to-day -day work. The first being um, that the student population is ever increasingly complex. We are seeing more, you know, variation, more atypicality of physical symptomatology. We see um, the interaction of mental health conditions in the context of our of our work. We're still dealing with the effects of COVID and the loss of or the potential loss of learning or loss of um, momentum that we have seen in our students. So, so that population, again, ever increasingly complex. Um, the expectations on us as practitioners are, are diverse and I think at times competing. And I know even on these uh, calls, these presentations that we've done um, with this amazing group that you guys have here, um, We've, we've discussed that, you know, many of you brought those up. Um, and so uh, understanding that those that the those expectations are diverse can be really um, at times challenged to our systems thinking. Our evidence is rapidly expanding um, and accessing that that evidence, translating it to our day to day practice can be um, can be time consuming. Um, can be challenging. Obviously, you guys are kind of ahead of the eight ball on this with the amount of work that you do on knowledge translation here on Echo Ties, but it's still difficult to bring that into your day-to-day -day work. Um, and then lastly, of course, organizational policy 
regulation and procedure change r- rapidly. Um, I know a little um, the, a little adage is, you know, wait a minute and you're going to have a new set of policies in place. Those are really significant challenges to our ability to integrate all of the inputs um, and to be able to effectively reflect and um, and use our understanding of outcomes to continually um, to continually engage in a systems thinking approach. Um, and so I think what we're what we're sort of pr- proposing is that in order to do this, in order to kind of build these natural feedback loops that that enable us to look at inputs and outcomes simultaneously to be able to keep, like I said earlier, all those balls in the air, it really requires that we're able to look at it all and simultaneously analyze them all. Um, Not only um, in the moment, but also kind of thinking about how they change over time. And then, uh, and then again, requires that continual analysis of inter interconnected outputs, um, and how one output influences change in all of the others. And and whenever I think about this 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 diagram, which by the way is is uh, I I know it's very primitive and and kind of maybe even a little uh, difficult or ugly, um, but it reminds me of like the butterfly perturbations, right? You know, you must have heard. You know, if you change one little, uh, you know, butterfly perturbation over in one part of the world, it's going to cause ultimate uh, uh, disruption somewhere else uh, down the pike. And so we know that when we change one of these particular um, variables, it can have a dramatic impact on any of the others in that particular system. Um, And so while I think a lot of the theories that are out there around systems thinking and a lot of the um, strategies that are in our literature for using um, systems thinking as a way to organize um, population and systems level uh, intervention and service, it's not as easier. It's not as easy as it appears. It's it's really really complex, and so we we recognize that level of complexity. So we've tried to figure out um, some of the tools that we can use for assist, uh, effective systems thinking, um, and many of these are not not new. Um, these are going to sound really familiar, um, but I think again in terms of our really developing strategies and developing tools that'll strengthen our ability to to do that holistic and um, and simultaneous processing, we need to be really intentional about implementing some of these tools. So the first is really understanding the diversity of the professional roles and responsibilities. Um, um, I think the more we understand about what the personal and professional competencies are that exist on our team, both within ourselves as well as the other people that are um, that are supporting that student, the family, the teachers, the system, um, the better off we are going to be able to do that level of of, um, of systems thinking. So I think that the the quality indicators, the PT competencies that I know you guys have spent a fair amount of time really looking at can be important tools for helping you identify what is your role, what is your responsibility, and what are the competencies that exist on my team that I can leverage to really support um, the outcomes of uh, in in a systems thinking framework. Um, the other one is finding opportunities for reflection. And I, I, I sometimes feel silly saying this because I recognize um, how much how much time, you know, just just how much time we have available in our in our day to day to sort of stop and, and spend some time in reflection. I, I, I know that that's easier said than done, but but finding those reflective opportunities to slow down, to really spend that time thinking so that we can take in all the information that um, across all of those dimensions that I talked about. So taking the time to reflect on our students, on our team competencies, 
on our school processes, maybe even what is happening at the level of the school and the school board can help us really think about um, what are all the balls in the air that I need to be concerning myself with in order to promote the best options mm -hmm. for, um, for our students. And I think one of the ways that we, we, can, we can think about that, and I know, I know we've talked about this as well, is adopting that workload approach. So we are really having that opportunity to slower, slower thinking down and being able to kind of spend the time that we need in order to look across all of those inputs and outputs. The third one that came to mind um, really is talking a lot about how we work with our teams. We understand our team. We now understand ourselves. Now we have to make sure that there are clear processes in place in order for us to really have um, effective, <clears throat> excuse me, deliberation and effective collaborative decision-making among those team members so that we can really truly account for all of those inputs and outputs with regard to um, the individual students, as well as the entire system that supports them. So really being able to ensure that we are incorporating as many of those kind of um, components of our, of our decision-making processes to support all of those resources. Um, and then another one, again, that comes to mind is being able to have explicit and collaborative tools that enable us to collaboratively analyze progress and outcomes across all of, the, of those range of outcomes. So we, it seems to me, we've gotten better and better and better at really developing solid collaborative tools for gathering, um, for, for collecting data on student progress and on student outcome. But do we have the tools to analyze how effectively we are at supporting teacher capacity? How effective are we at establishing and helping schools to meet their goals? Are we talking about, and you guys have probably heard me say this over and over again, but are we talking about the ways in which we're supporting our schools and our school districts at achieving their priority initiatives? They're doing that work with or without us. So wouldn't it be cool if we could develop those collaborative tools to be able to talk about, here are the ways that we're supporting outcomes across all of those important um, outputs that our schools and our school boards are, are interested in. So I think we need to be thinking about how can we collaborate and develop um, tools to, to measure outcomes that go beyond our students, but also talking about our value outcomes for that school division as a whole. We're doing that work. We, we need to, to kind of blow our own horn a little bit in, in some of that regard. So some of the pathways that we spent some time thinking about that we think could be helpful in, um, in developing those, those efficiencies are, uh, are we've, we've tried to kind of collapse them a little bit here. So being really attentive to the high leverage practices, I think that's an, a critically important pathway. We know that our, our educators, that our teachers and admin are paying attention to what are the evidence-based approaches to really achieving um, best student outcomes. And so I think as we pay attention to high leverage practices, we develop the language around high leverage practices, and we talk to educators and administrators about the ways that we support them in collaboration, assessment, social emotional development and instruction, we can have, we can really influence um, that system and support its achievement of outcomes across those outputs. So building interprofessional skills, Built, finding opportunities to strengthen ourselves in the in our collaborative practices. And again, um, developing processes to ensure 
that we're effectively communicating with teams and families. Um, I think that, um, you know, there was that little silver lining in COVID where we were really connected to families and we were really um, having that opportunity to have conversations with them around things that matter to them. Um, and so finding ways that we can continue to, to build on those opportunities that came to us inadvertently um, can help our ability to support high leverage practices. Um, looking at assessment, I think we can, we can lead the way um, for many of our school teams in assessment because we already do a lot of the work around um, looking across multiple sources of data as we evaluate our students. We analyze data to inform instruction and intervention. And I think we can do some really important role modeling for our teams in, in terms of that um, gathering data for assessment. Um, getting involved in PBIS. Um, many, many of us are involved in, in social emotional learning programs within our schools. Um, and, and certainly addressing mental health across, across disciplines, um, finding ways to support the mental health initiatives um, in, uh, you know, again, um, across populations can be a critical um, support and resource for our team. And finally, in the area of instruction, uh, again, these are not new concepts. These are things that we've been doing for a long time, but being aware of and supporting UDL in classrooms and schools, helping our schools adapt curricular material and instruction so that it's available for all. And then, um, and then look into the high, lever high leverage practices. We've got the link here, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but, but really finding ways to help teachers and schools use effective teaching strategies across those high leverage practices are I think are areas that we again can really excel in and support support our teams. A second pathway, again, I had mentioned earlier about ESSA, but um, another important pathway is, is developing um, supports around the multi-tiered systems of supports. And um, I don't think I need to particularly go into great detail here, but looking across those three tiers, how is it that we can promote universal participation and promotion for, um, for, for students. So looking across ways, and we, we, we know we've got many really strong evidence-based um, approaches to, um, to advance participation and promotion at play, at recess, in the cafeteria, in the classroom. We can help our students um, by, by creating structures that um, promote friendship that enhance meaningful co uh, conversation. We can create sensory friendly environments, material adaptation, et cetera. Um, and then at tier two, really thinking about um, targeted participation. So again, I, I know we do a lot of this work already, but small activity-based groups and environment and uh, modifying and accommodating in the environment. So I think we can use the um, multi-tiered system of support as a way to really build um, pathways for systems level thinking that can change those important outcomes for all of our uh, for all of our students. So you know, moving forward, I think we have some work to do. Again, we don't have. I think one of the most um, the salient um, points for me as I as I started to do this work is we don't really have <clears throat> clear um, theoretical processes on how to implement um, professional reasoning as it comes as it, as it relates to systems thinking. But um, but I think we have some of the practices that we can put in place. So some of the other things that I think we might want to think about is, you know, how do we think about um, the broader scope of information that we really need to be thinking about and looking at? What are the tools 
and the skills that we need either within our own school districts or as sort of from our professional um, practices to look at the populations that we serve. Who are they? What are the causality and risk factors that we, we need to be thinking about? I think we need to move, we need tools to move beyond our kind of our knowledge of individual students and what individual um, approaches are unique to them, but be able to look at a whole population and, and identify the range of possibilities of interventions that we can put in place for them. Um, <clears throat> again, we need the skills to critically appraise that information so that we can put in place um, interventions that perhaps, you know, don't come from, uh, uh, the research doesn't necessarily come from school practice, but if we understand more fully our populations, we can be thinking about ways that we can um, we can uh, look at those um, those kinds of interventions for unique uh, students. Dynamic knowledge translation models. We don't have those really well established for school practice, so we need to um, to develop some more and have more conversations about how are we effectively translating knowledge so that it changes the outcomes for our students. Um, and then the last one I think um, always comes to mind when I think about, um, uh, you know, the range of possibilities of, 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 um, of options. So we know that there are many options that are available to us, but we need that sort of ethical reflexivity to determine which is the best one to be made. Um, and I think when we have, when we kind of achieve these particular outcomes, we can be more effectively situated in providing um, systems level thinking and systems level intervention across our students and across our, um, our, uh, our systems, our schools. So, um, okay. I think this is, yes, this is you. yeah. Yes. So, um, how do we start? Where do we go? And if you've heard us talk, you'll probably, you've heard some of this and I'm going to go through it a little bit quick because I really do want to allow for some time, a little more time than we normally have for discussion. Cause there's some great comments happening in the chat. And, um, I think this brings up, this discussion brings up more questions than it does answers at times, but, where do we start? Um, about a year, a little over a year ago, um, I came across this book that I have been thinking a lot about um, and have read twice now. Um, and it, it talks a lot about how we keep adding and adding and adding. In, those of us who work in educational systems, we keep adding, but we never de-implement. We don't take away. And so if we're talking about we need to to start thinking about populations and systems based. <clears throat> we're not necessarily thinking that that we need to add, keep doing everything that we've been doing and adding this in. It might be that there are some things that we could um, de-implement within our practices within the schools. And um, what gets de-implemented in one system might be different than another system. So. Uh, an OT example that I often think of is maybe we de-implement all the one-on-one -on -one handwriting types of activities that we're doing, and we add, instead, we work more at a systems level. We get onto the um, onto the literacy committees. Um, we work with making sure that there's appropriate um, um, strategies. Um, we help school districts ensure that they have a handwriting curriculum and that there's a sensory base to that. You know, all those different things that we know, but we start maybe at a systems level and maybe we won't have as many students that need the one-on-one -on -one, um, later. And um, we could do a whole session just on de-implementation, but um, if you look up, um, if you just put in de-implementation in DeWick, I think at the end that we have the, it, this also in the resources, it's a, it is a book that I think is every school-based practitioner should read and think about because we really do want to think about what, 
what are some of the practices that we have accepted that we think are lead to the best outcomes that don't necessarily? So another example are um, a few years ago, a whole the research study came out with children with cerebral palsy and learning new um, motor patterns, and that NDT was not as effective as we had all thought. And maybe we need to de-implement some of that. Oh, thanks. Patty just put the link for the book in the chat too. Um, maybe we need to de-implement and use more motor learning theory and some of the other um, practices that they found were effective for um, for these children. So, so really thinking through what um, we need to do. So we're not saying that you should get off this call and go start working at a populations and systems level. We, we're really, we've been thinking about this for about um, four years now. Um, and we recently finished a chapter and a book around some of it and, and really found that there's not a whole lot of information out there to help us. So we're really trying to think carefully about how do we do this so that we do it right, so that we don't end up um, with another strategy that just didn't take off as much as we wanted. So we want to inquire, we want to we want to plan, we're going to think about what we need to de-implement, we think about um, what we're going to add in. And there's de-implementation doesn't mean that you just totally get rid of something. It might be a partial um, reversal. It might be that you think about what you're going to um, substitute with. There maybe are some things that we're doing in the schools that we shouldn't be doing and other things that we should be doing, especially as you think about some of the mental health crises that um, we're seeing within our schools. Um, we want to think about our priorities. And when we do that, and we're thinking about that in terms of de-implementation, we need to think about ourselves, the teams we're working with, the client services and supports, the environment, and and the research, and um, and that all of those things help us identify our priorities as we think about what we're going to de-implement. De and if you do get the book, they have a lot of little work, um, work little work activities that you do, and little thought processes you go through, and ways that help you to prioritize and. Um, there's this whole de-implementation science that is starting to emerge, um, not just within education, but in other businesses and uh, in other places as well. So really thinking careful because we can't keep adding and adding um, into all that we do. The other piece to be thinking about is change. What? How do you respond to change? How does your system respond to change? What type of model of change do you, do you want to use? If you think that you're going to move more towards populations and systems, then then how do we get there? And what's the right time with the right vision? And that leads to the optimal change. Um, and so we don't want to force the change and we don't want to go with not having enough information, but we want to carefully have some conversations and think about what this um, looks like I, you know, I was talking with some administrators and I was sharing that I was, we were doing this talk and they were like, oh, 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 well, but how would I know the therapist is doing what they're supposed to be doing? That was the first comment I got. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, if there's IEP minutes, they have to fulfill the IEP minutes. I'm like, well, if they commit to meeting a system's need, they're going to fulfill that system's need. But there's a whole lot within this change that we're going to have to help, even within some of how we've traditionally thought about how we track what we do and who does what and when it gets done and, and so forth. Um, yeah, so we want some of that um, optimal change. And again, some of that's going to come by using our practice guidance, using IDEA, um, ESSA, your state guidance. Um, you guys in Oregon particularly have some great resources that can help you um, think through um, some of this. Um, when you start imagining change, this is um, that whole one of the change cycles to be thinking about. Again, there's a whole, numerous ones out there, and part of it is finding the one that works well for you. Um, I'm actually in a cup in about an hour and a half giving a. Um, lecture on change to our graduate students. And so I was reviewing that last night. And one of the things that I, I always have to remind myself is that change is, it's healthy if you look at it as a spiral, right? So you go through this process of change, but then 
you come to, oh, I, I need to still continue to change. So you're kind of spiraling up. It's not like a one time through the circle and you've, um, you're have you able to implement and, and you've got everything taken care of. So one of the things that you can think about then within that is, you know, here's some questions of, are you aware of the possibilities? That's what we're hoping to do today is make you aware of some of the possibilities of working in a populations or systems. But hopefully, and we're seeing, I think some of the chat comments lead to this next one of, so what are my options? What am I gonna have to take into, into account? And how do I start small? Um, and then, you know, I'm going to do it, you do some action, and then you look at how to keep it going. But we're really still at that pre-contemplation contemplation. What are the possibilities? What would happen if OTs and PTs worked more at a population systems level? And what are our options? Where's the best place to start some of that? And then how can we be effective in really um, helping students and families participate to that maximum um, extent possible. Um, so, Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about this one? Sorry about that. Um, one of the really um, cool opportunities that Yvonne and I have had, um, particularly in light of some of the work that we've done around the quality indicators, is we've had the opportunity to sit with a number of people who have used the quality indicators to promote their own individual uh, practice ideas, as well as the ideas um, that they have for their entire um, program or school. And one of the things that we've noticed is almost all of them say to us, this, I have an idea. Um, and what we, what we've discovered is that, you know, it's just that simple. I mean, it seems silly to say, but um, that is how many of these initiatives start. Um, it starts with how, you know, this idea that you have um, and where where you'd like to see things go. Um, and, and in many cases, just as we've we, I talked about earlier, like many times it's they've identified an input that they would like to see um, a change in and know that if they change that input that the potential outcomes are very strong and oftentimes across multiple of uh, multiple components. Um, so we invite you to, to do that, to take that time, have an idea, figure out how it could possibly take shape, um, how you can get others to share your vision um, and how you can convey that passion and interest that you have. Um, and, and it just has always seemed to us that, um, that those ideas are often all it takes to really um, build enough momentum, build enough engagement to sort of fill the bank and just really facilitate change in your, in your particular practice setting. So one of the things too to think about is where are you? Um, you know, um, in your setting, what is working well? There could be some things that are already in place that's working really well, and those should be kept. You should identify and celebrate those. What's okay, what could be improved, and what definitely needs to ch change. And thinking about that within the context of um, of systems and supports. What are things? You know, um, many school districts are starting to take more and more of a of a um, business model. And what's your distinct value? And what's the value added of having you here? So thinking about, you know, I'll go back to the handwriting example. Well, if an OT can be working at a systems level, we might be able to impact this many more kids and have this much more time available to address other things. And so. We also, as we're making some of these, having some of these discussions and thinking about some of this, we also want to think about how to frame some of it into the language that's important and the and the framework of understanding that's important for our administrators, as well as others on our team. We also want to look at the capacity of red and readiness for change. Sometimes we know that um, it needs to happen, but um, capacity and um, readiness is not um, there yet. And so you might have to slow yourself down. And 
you might have to um, do some more talking with different individuals. Um, you might have to think about um, who else, what are other stakeholders that you might want to pull into the conversation before implementing some of it. Um, knowing when you're ready and what's the right time, I think there does become a mic, what I like to call the Nike moment to to change. There's a, comes a time you just got to do it. Right. We can think it, we can think it over and we can become really good at, well, what about and looking at all the angles. And there does come that point that, OK, I just got to do it. That's why I like thinking about change as a spiral, because I'm just going to do it. But part of change is that you continue to evaluate outcomes. And so you continue to um, adjust and, and we just continue to move in the direction that we want. Um, but you do want to ask yourself some of these questions. Is the capacity and are we at that readiness um, for change? I think some of the mental health crisis in our schools puts us at a place where we're ready for some change. Um, and there is a lot that OTs and PTs have to offer. And I've had a couple of my PT colleagues go, what? What do you mean? We have so much data around how physical activity helps with mental health and um, really being able to talk about some of that and and the importance that we can bring into the schools to help um, students. And that's just one example. So um, we're going to end with a, just a series of slides. That a lot of these um, we put in place more for you to reflect back on. Um, in the hand, there is the slide deck is available to you in the, on the Echo ties. Um, the Echo um, Chandra can tell you how to get there. <laughs> I Echo platform. Yes. Right there you go. Um, and so, but we wanted to give you. So, how do you realign and prioritize? How do you start thinking about some of this? Um, and it really, it's just another way of summarizing some of what we've just said and then adding a couple extra points. One is to um, go think, go through some of that reflection, have some um, discussion and start with some goal um, setting. And then think about some um, implementation. Maybe you're just going to implement one little piece but make sure that you're taking data and that you're doing some outcome measurements so that you know that what you're doing is getting you in the direction that you want to go. And I know that sometimes it's hard to get to that, that outcome measurement and really looking at some of it, but that helps with some of the dissemination and that helps us be able to share um, with others what we're doing and how, how, we're, um, how we got there. Then think about realignment. So how do we get to our effectiveness that leads to student achievement? So we may need to spend some time um, as professionals thinking about some targeted professional development or thinking about some um, um, communities of practice that have some discussion around um, change and working at a systems level, but always keeping in mind that our goal is increased student achievement. So how do we focus on some of this? How do we um, think about some of the student needs? And then what do we need to do to be prepared to meet some of those needs? And then how do we prioritize that? How do we really um, establish goals that focus on um, outcomes um, rather than activity? So there's a whole lot of things that we can do um, but we want to make sure that we're doing the best things that get us to the outcomes of where we want to be. So we want to strategically orient to focus on the student learning outcomes and then focus our efforts to get to that point. And then again, make sure that we're taking some data. Are we meeting our targeted goals? And 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 I'll just say this. I think sometimes the, um, taking that targeted data can be challenging. And so we may need to think about it in terms of fidelity. So not just in how many students um, improved, but also in how many students were you able to impact? What is family satisfaction with your activities? What is the, the administration satisfaction? All those types, all the different fidelity um, considerations that tell us that we're moving in the direction that we um, wanted to go. Um, think about reflection and goal setting, implementation, outcome measurement. 
that there's a tight summary of what we were just um, um, saying there. And then here's some um, um, reflective questions to think about in kind of pulling, thinking about de-implementation and goal development. In his book, DeWitt says it's important to remember that it's not as much about preferences as it is about what practices are low value and what add up to value. So really thinking about um, what are your goals? Where do you want to go? How valuable or important? Maybe we need to adjust some of our goals. Um, how soon do you expect to see um, progress? What um, What is sufficient evidence that you need to be able to share? Um, would all stake, I love this question he asked, will all the stakeholders in the program trust the same evidence? And that kind of goes back to some of that fidelity. And so how do we... Um, be able to talk about our outcomes so that everybody who is valued um, know that. And Patty just said, thank you. She had another meeting, so she had to um, um, sign off to go to that. But really um, think about um, some of this and think about it in terms of some of our um, professional growth um, as well. And then you want to take a point to think about how do you jump right in and um, taking the small steps, um, making sure you have some of the resources that you need. Um, remember that both successes and failures help us grow. So failure is not bad. You have a growth mindset as you walk into this. Failure is a way of learning and thinking about how we might do it differently the, um, the next time. And so um, really think about con connecting with others who are thinking also about populations and systems-based interventions and having some um, discussions and seeing what others are doing or um, have done and what are some of their outcomes. But again, at some point, thinking about where you can um, jump in to start um, really thinking about, reflecting on, and then doing um, some activities around some of this. All right, so um, here's how you can get a hold of us if you want to um, share any additional thoughts, but I really wanna stop the um, sh slide share and have some time. We've got about a little more than 10 minutes to have some discussion, because I know we probably brought up a lot of um, questions. Ron, I have found myself saying yes with exclamation points and so many of the points uh, that you brought out. It's a foundation to the conversations we're having here and appreciate your expertise and, and welcome anybody to, uh, in processing what you've thought about today, what are your questions? What are your ideas? Feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and share. Really quick, I would like to say that just as a lay person, um, the concept of de-implementation is absolutely my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, as a, a parent of, you know, kids in school, I I go to these trainings, tons of them, right? And And they're always talking about what more you guys need to do in the schools. And I'm like, I feel overwhelmed for everybody. Like, how can you just keep doing more and more and more? You can't, like Deb likes to say, like, you cannot, you cannot do more with, without getting, in our case, more money, you know? Um, and that's the case in schools too. And, and I just think that de-implementation is, is a novel concept that I just haven't heard through all of the trainings that I've been to. So yeah, my book is like dog-eared, marked up. Uh, I mean, it, it, um, yeah, it's been really, and, and, and I was shocked to find there's this whole de-implementation science. And, and as I've been reading, I'm like, oh, I need to do this in my life too. And I need to do, you know, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it really resonates with where our society is right now. And that, um, sometimes less is more and really thinking, thinking that through and, and helping our kids with some of that because so, some of the demands on some of our kids is incredible. So. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, Yvonne, I'd love to get a copy of that. But, uh, I don't suppose you have any extra at the UPS library or something. I live two blocks from there. I don't know if the there. library ever got it, but it's not that expensive. And she put oh. the link for Amazon in there. But I, I, in, I, in reflecting on this, I, um, this really resonates with my style of practice, but I also feel at times I'm an unusual one. I'm at, in the Tacoma School District, for those of you who don't know me. Um, but I think it also gets down to workload versus caseload. Um, and the promise that we will stay working with those teams, even if we um, discharge our kids or, you know, to, to, you know, see it in a different way, that we're going to still support that staff and that the district behind us has that commitment. But I think what you're saying is much more ethical um, because I often find in the middle school, high schools, it's kind of random which kids happen to come to me. It's often to teach them tech. I'm like, well, a third of that LRC class, a third of that SPED class needs to learn this. Why am I working with just one student? So I don't even feel like when we keep on kids as individual that it even um, upholds our standard, uh, our ethical practice that is um, in our AOTA um, ethical guidelines. Um, but we really will have a hard time getting there until we really go workload and and just especially in, and um, get rid of caseload is my thoughts. Um, and I, I will have to look at that book. Yeah. Well, but I think I'll challenge you a little bit, Cynthia, because if you look at all the workload caseload literature, um, it's not to get rid of caseload. It's to redefine well, your caseload within the context. It. And, yes. and actually it increase it, 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 it. What they really clearly say is it's not a, a it's you, it, and, and it's it's having some of the discussion with administrators. It allows you to have a larger caseload. I mean, it's kind of like what our nurses experience, right? Their caseloads can be hundreds and thousands of kids because they're working at a systems level. And so it's kind of the same um, idea with that too. Um, well, so Carrie, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. So Carrie just asked, how do you deal with IEP minutes if you're providing less direct support? So first of all, if you're a related service provider, you do not have to be doing only direct um, support right. for for kids. And so you can um, be thinking about then within the context of related services that maybe you're doing these activities and, and um, as a related service with that child. But it might be that there are some um, students that have um, related service minutes or even supplementary aids and service minutes on an IEP that maybe don't need that if you're um, part of that system, if you're working at a um, go with like Cynthia's um, idea, if she's doing some tech stuff for the whole classroom, then maybe that's not down on that front page matrix of the IEP, but it's part of the programming and somehow communicated that way. But that's some of those logistical things that I said we still need to really have some conversations around. Um, Chelsea, if you'd something? like to unmute yourself and, and ask that question, that would be great. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no. you, Yvonne. I was just, just going to read the question so she can ask it. Okay. So, so when working at the systems level, we've been tossing around this idea and like even within the last week, some of the like last holdouts on our team are like, I, I'm kind of digging this like coaching, like being more with systems. And it's like, okay, we're all kind of getting on the same page. So now we're to this like, okay, now what do we do? And so thinking like when we're working at the system level, we're still going to have these individual IEPs. They're still going to have, you know, collaborative goals, team goals. So when we're working at this level, what are some examples of outcomes that we'd be seeking like, you know, as a whole, but then that we could also apply to these individual students? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think part of the challenge is it's gonna vary from student to student, right? Um, and this is where I was saying, I think we've got to start thinking more in terms of fidelity. So for, if you're looking at some of the outcomes that we can attribute to us, right? Because now all of a sudden, it's a collaborative goal. Everybody's working on it. And so if somebody says, well, okay, OT, what part of this goal or okay, PT, what part of this goal was because of you, outcome was because of you, is going to be harder to say. 
but the fidelity is going to be in that as a team, we've established this outcome. As a team, we've been taking data and in fact, look, because as a team, we've been taking the data, the um, student is showing that he, he she can um, um, do the activity across individuals, across contexts. And now we're seeing increased independence and participation. So looking at that, everybody's satisfied with, uh, you know, a satisfaction measure with teachers and parents. Are you satisfied with my level of communication? Do you feel like you got enough feedback from me? Um, some of those things. We're seeing some things, um, and I haven't gotten to explore it as much as I want, but starting to emerge in the coaching literature of how do you, um, um, how, how do you, um, how, how do you g gather some satisfaction ratings and see that the person's able to, you brought in sensory strategies and the teacher's able to implement the str sensory strategies in the classroom might be one of the outcomes. So it's, it's changing some of our outcomes and thinking about um, uh, it's kind of those UDL principles and all of that, thinking about it more at that uh, greater level. And then Carrie just asked, you know, well, if we're providing less minutes, how do you show admin that you still need a full time? We're not providing less minutes. And I th and this is the piece that I think we really have to work on is changing our language. Our, our workload is not just IEP minutes. And so, and so part of it is having some discussion around um, our work, our workload, our, our minutes that we're providing is, um, includes working at this systems level. And um, and Carrie, I think administrators do challenge, I think they do get it more than they think they get it, but so historically, our time's been tied to IEP minutes. And so somehow that's one of those things we have to de-implement is that our time is not I tied to IEP minutes. And so some of the workload, um, caseload content that's available from ASHA, the joint statement from APTA, AOTA, and ASHA, all of that helps with that. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes, but one of the things um, a, a therapist that I know did went into their administrator and just started listing. So I just want to have a clear idea of what my job is and started talking about the direct services, but also um, t talked about I'm supposed to um, take care of equipment. I'm supposed to support this at a systems level. I'm support supposed to be doing this and so forth. They um, kept kept saying, oh, you don't have enough time to do all this. And that got them talking more about the workload um, and thinking about, okay, what does it look like? And how 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 would your administrator want you to document some of what you're doing? How, how does your administrator document what, they, what they're doing? Because they're impacting all of these kids, but they don't have minutes on the IEP because they're working at a systems level. So it's kind of having some of the those discussions and making sure that as you're having some of those discussions that you're including those stakeholders who need to be part of the, the discussion. So like one of the things I, I do for parents when they're kind of like, oh no, you've got to be working one-on-one -on -one with my child is I'll take and I'll draw, I'll take the child's name and I'll draw and I'll say, okay, I'm gonna work one-on-one -on -one for 30 minutes a week. And I, I draw that in one color, a line with a bubble that says OT, 30 minutes a week. And then I'll say, okay, but instead I'm gonna take this 30 minutes a week and I'm gonna work with the teacher. And then I draw a line with a, draw a bunch of lines with a bubble. At entry, the teacher's gonna work on this with fine motor skills within the context of this. And during this task with this. So all of a sudden in another color, we have five or six bubbles of where the fine motor's gonna be reinforced every single day. So they can have 30 minutes once a week or we can look, step back and start working more at a systems, more at a population with the whole classroom, getting those sensory strategies, whatever it is that we're doing. And now all of a sudden, you can see how that child is getting those supports more. So we want to um, share and we need to change some of our language or how we're presenting some of this so that they, families, administrators, other stakeholders, teachers um, understand the benefit so that, you know, yes, you can have 30 minutes once a week, a break from this kid out of your classroom, 
or I can work with you in the classroom and help you come up with strategies so managing this child's behavior is easier every single day for the full six hours they're in school. Right. And so we want to, we're, we're reaching, we, we need to change how we're having some of that conversation. So I think we are like about out of time, but if, if people are interested in wanting to continue this conversation, shoot Patty and I some emails. We're really um, thinking a lot about this. I'm sure we'll have some more thoughts as um, time comes out. Um, and as we continue to kind of, try and look in the literature and find some strategies that'll be helpful for us.